Okay, uh, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel for you this afternoon, and we're gonna talk about a topic that really is at the heart of education issues today. Um, it's something that I'm sure that everyone here is very much concerned with, and I'm delighted to present four amazing and successful practitioners of successful education models all around the world. So um, the topic for today is how to replicate excellence from leading schools. And then embedded in this topic are three questions. First question, of course, is what are great practices and what are leading schools? Second question is, can great practices from leading schools be replicated across cultures and geographies? Are schools necessarily embedded in the communities? Um, are schools a reflection of the communities and therefore it's very difficult to replicate successful cultures across communities. And the third question then is, then is, if we can replicate models, how can we do so? So uh, let's start off with Barnaby Lennon. He is chairman of the Independent Schools Council in the United, in the United Kingdom. And he, he, helps, he helps oversee 1,300 schools in the UK. Uh, Britain finished 26th on the math PISA. But as Barnaby Lennon has said many times, if you look at the independent schools in the UK as a system, as a whole, it would place actually number one in, on the PISA by far. So, Barnaby, what are the great practices of leading schools, and, wh and what are leading schools? Well, um, first of all, Jiang, we don't think that uh, all our practices can be replicated anywhere because our schools they charge fees, they on the whole have very supportive parents, some of them are academically selective, um, but there are things which we think are very important about our schools. They're independent of the government, and the government, as well as doing some good things, has done quite a lot of bad things to schools in England uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, we're market-driven, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on uh, activities outside the classroom, the development of culture, uh, culture, character, leadership, those sort of things. Um, but we certainly uh, don't believe that we um, have the expertise which would allow us to contribute in any way to schools in very disadvantaged areas um, or to vocational training, those sort of things, about which we know relatively little. So we have a limited area of expertise, but aspects of that we think are transferable. And um, over the last 15 years, but particularly re more recently than that, the government in Britain has encouraged us to lend our resources and expertise to the state sector. And three years ago, I'm just going to give you one example. Three years ago, uh, we eight independent schools, including Eton, where Tony's the headmaster, decided to set up um, a free school in the east end of London. Now, London, as a whole, has pretty good educational standards, but Newham was, uh, in, in, in the east end of London, close to the Olympic site, was an exception to that. Very bad uh, exam results and a very bad track record of entry to university. Now, the one thing that we, are, we can say, I think, with some confidence, and that is that our schools get very good exam results at the age of 18, and we have a very good track record of entry into the top university. So we were encouraged these eight independent schools to set up what in, in Britain is called a free school, paid for by the taxpayer, a normal state school, but in the borough of Newham, with the idea of transforming their exam results and their record of entry to university. And each of the eight independent schools agreed to sponsor one or two academic subjects. So they were going to lend their best teachers to our school to help train up and give advice to our teachers, and many, many of whom were quite young and inexperienced. Um, and then, a little bit later in the process, we would lend all our expertise in relation to university admissions, which is quite complicated, requires a, you know, years of experience and knowledge, which we had. So we set up this school, it costs four million pounds, not very much, just in a converted office block um, close to the Olympic site, and um, uh, away we went. And we only offer uh, those A-level subjects which are thought to be quite difficult and therefore the most in demand from the 20 to 30 most selective universities in the UK. And this last summer, uh, we got the first set of A-level results. We were the first free school 
in England to get exam results, so the focus of the media and to some extent the government was on us. And in terms of uh, one measure, the percentage of students getting two A's and a B, which is the basic minimum requirement for getting into the best universities, in these harder subjects, we were the top school in England. Congratulations. So what we would say is we have uh, a limited but deep knowledge and experience in certain areas which are transferable. And in this case, knowledge of how to teach these hardest subjects most effectively and, and then give the best advice to enable these students, nearly all of whom come from disadvantaged backgrounds, to get them into the best schools. And in the context of the London Borough of Newham, we have already doubled the number of pupils going on to Oxford, Cambridge, and other good universities. And we expect that trend to continue. So we think we, you know, we're humble enough to know our place, but we're willing to contribute in those areas where we can. So my follow-up question is, you have taken a um, public school and you made it a success. If, all, if you were to mobilize all the resources of your independent school system, how many public schools do you think you could impact successfully? Well, remember that in, uh, the, in, in the United Kingdom, only 7% of pupils go to independent schools. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you just said, I'm, my organization gives assistance to 1,300 schools, which is a pretty small proportion of the total. So there's absolutely no way that we could be responsible for helping to transform the system throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. Sure. We can help in limited areas wi with our limited expertise. Great, fantastic. So Tony Little is headmaster, head of school at Eton College. Everyone's heard of Eton. It was founded in 1440 by King Henry VI. And since then, it has educated 19 British prime ministers, prime ministers including the current one, David Cameron. Um, um, Mr. Little is considered one of the most successful headmasters in Eton history. Uh, he has basically brought Eton into the top echelon of academic excellence. He is also the co-founder of the World Leading Schools Association, which brings together the best Chinese schools with the best Western schools to work together. So, uh, Mr. Little, the question for you then is, how have you, what are the great practices at, at Eton, and what can we learn from, from Eton today? Eton is a, a boarding school, so at a stroke, it's different from the vast majority of schools around the world. But being a full boarding school where 1,300 teenagers are there right the way through the week, through the evening, this in, for some teachers is a nightmare prospect, but we have our young people with us all the time. And that can raise the stakes in some way. Mm, mm. But it gives enormous opportunities to enable us as teachers to help fashion an environment which we think is going to encourage young people to be able to grow and to experiment and to explore themselves. The key point of what we're trying to do is to give our young people the self-belief, the confidence to feel that they can change the world. I sometimes say to boys, I want people who are going to roll up their sleeves and get things done, mm. not just stand on the sidelines and witter and complain. So it is a, a purposeful environment. Now, it's hard to take a boarding experience and bottle it and give it to day schools, whether they're state or private schools, in different parts of the world. But there are certain things I think you can learn from that experience. In part, it's to do with culture. And I don't think there's any shortcut. Very often, when I speak to people in government, there's a belief that you can have a bite-sized chunk of something, that you can bottle it, and then the magic pill. Stardust, call it what you will. And it really doesn't work. If I've learned anything at all in the 26 years now that I've been a headmaster, it's that what one is spending every working moment of the day doing is reinforcing culture. Mm, mm. It's to do with the way things interconnect. Mm, mm. So, for example, we try as, as a, although our academic standards have risen, it has not been as a consequence of focusing on exam results. Now, that may sound counterintuitive, but I very strongly believe this. If you focus on exam results, it's like sowing on very thin soil. You may get some instant quick hits, but it doesn't breed a state of mind where you're going to replicate and sustain that focus on academic life. So our sights are set further. It's where students are going to go to university, what they're going to do later in life. And as it were, exam results are a means to an end. Mm, mm. We hope they will be good. And generally speaking, they are right at the top end. But it's more to do with, with a point of focus. And the same is true of other parts of life. Everything interconnects. Ian Forster, the English novelist, 
at the beginning of uh, one of his novels simply had the phrase, only connect. And in many ways, that's what great schools should be seeking to do, is connecting all aspects of life. It is a truly holistic experience. And I know that word holistic is being used so much, it's had the stuffing, the meaning ripped out of it. But it seems to me part and parcel of the whole thing. And the reason I'm banging on about this in quite such a, such a way is that in my experience in England, but also in other parts of the world, the drive, particularly by government, to have measurement. And I can understand why they need some apparent factual proof of what their policies are doing. But the drive for measurement has become a thing in itself. Mm, mm, mm. And that's the wrong, completely the wrong way to go about it. And the only way we can sustain great schools is by focusing on that culture which embraces all aspects of school life and is going to encourage our young people to be great citizens, which is really the point of the, the whole exercise. What words would you, would you use to describe the culture at, at Eton? What, what are sort of the, the adjectives that come to mind when you talk about the culture at Eton? It's competitive, mm. but it is also tolerant in a broad sense. One of the things that delights me about the place is that young people feel they get a parity of esteem, whether or not they're a great sportsman or a, uh, a writer of editorial, or whether they are actors, or whether clothes designers. I mean, there's an extraordinary tolerance of the range of things that people do, and indeed of beliefs that are expressed. But it is competitive in the sense that people drive each other on. So being seen to be good at something is very much part and part of the culture. And that I like. Great. Thank you so much. So um, what I've heard so far from Barnaby is great teachers. Um, you use great teachers who know, who know their material. The students will do well. What, what I've heard from Tony is create a culture that makes students confident about who they are and interested in learning and appreciate the diversity with, uh, within your student population. But then the question then is, that's great if you're a boarding school in the UK. You have all these resources. But what do you do? if you are an impoverished culture, an impoverished country, um, that's, what, what's the solution then? Thankfully, we have an expert in this area. Vicky Colbert is the founder of the new Escula, um, the Escula Nuova model. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't speak Spanish. But um, she founded in 1975, and she's been able to, uh, she founded in 1975 in rural Colombia. And since then, it has expanded to 16 countries, different cultures, different geographies, uh, different social, um, so, social, social economic groups. And now it serves five million children. Five million children have benefited from her model in both rural Colombia and in Vietnam. So Vicky, what's the secret of, su of your success? <laughs> Coming from a totally different context, um, when you have to face so many problems, so many difficulties, you're forced to think systemically <laughs> from the beginning. And the design from the beginning was that anything we did had to be technically viable, that any teacher with a PhD or without a PhD in the middle of the jungle could transform the way of learning. By the way, Escuela Nueva, tough for many people to say it, means new school. And what we did was just put nothing new in the philosophy of education. We just took the ideas that we know about good quality education from 100 years ago, Montessori, John Dewey, the, you know. But we wanted to bring it to the poorest, to the poor isolated schools. Because all these ideas, especially in Latin America, they come to the elite schools, but not to the poorest, to the poor. So just, I just want to clarify that. So it's active participatory learning, a new role of the teacher, uh, self-paced learning, all the things that we're talking about now. but. We were forced into this because we had to handle diversity. Mm, mm. OK, so the first thing was that anything we did, our intervention would be technically viable. So going back, that any teacher could do it. Because if you're in the middle of the jungle, you, know, you cannot have a PhD there. Second, politically viable. Mm. Latin America is very strong with unions. And if teachers are not the actors of change, it's not going to work. And financially feasible. When you don't have resources, you have to rethink and rethink and rethink everything to make it work. So we had to rethink everything. And we really came into a shift of a learning paradigm, which is not new. 
and really focus on the child-centered and the new modern ideas of education, but we put them in practice in a very simple way. Because we, I think an, the, another issue was how to transform complexity mm. into simple, manageable action so that anybody could do it. Because in education, there are just too many variables, too, too many variables. And we focused on the school as a unit of change. Um, so the first thing, and, and by the way, I want to clarify because this is very important. It has expanded because we had a lot of research behind, mm. empirical evidence, World Bank, UNESCO, multilaterals, bilaterals. Stanford. Um, so many organizations, you know, they came, they said, because we started working on the isolated rural multi-grade schools, which are sort of invisible, according to Angela Little from the Institute of Education of the University of London. They're invisible to most educational planners. So this is, this is where we started. This is not when we ended. This is where we started. But we had to make things, we had to have procedures, systems in place, so that things could be easily replicated by any other teacher. And we wanted to have teachers have a demand-driven approach that they would say, when they see a school, they could say, we can do it. Mm, mm. It's just done more work. Because especially in Latin America, unions are very strong. So we had to th think of a very, very practical intervention that could be easily replicated. But what I want to be very sincere is that it has expanded mainly through governments. It's not my small NGO in Colombia. I then had to create an NGO. No? Um, but it was mainly picked up by governments. UNESCO would bring people, USAID would bring people to Colombia. Uh, World Bank once it selected it as one of the innovations that had successfully impacted national policies. We got many countries coming in. So we have organized these sessions. The most recent two years ago, Iraq came, Vietnam came, because we had evidence. So we have a proven solution that has worked. But it's not my small NGO that's you know, leading this because we, we don't have the capacity to grow our organization. We want to grow our impact. So it's been picked up by many governments, but we don't control that. So it's very, it's, I want to make, make the clarity. It's not us controlling all this, what's happening in 16 countries or 17 countries. Sure. We just have inspired many educational reforms. And we have an international strategy to make things happen. Right. So but research and empirical evidence was key. Thank you. So Tony mentioned pastoral care um, at, at, at Eton, um, making sure that the students have a great boarding school experience in, at Eton. Uh, but Vicky, from what I've read so far about your program, there's a lot of focus on community engagement, getting the parents involved as much as possible. Can you talk a little, a little about, that, about community engagement um, in your program? Well, we know, that, we know the theory of education. We have all the ideas. I think everybody has clarity on that. The, the thing is how to put it in practice in a simple way. So um, what do we promote? Nothing new. <laughs> Active participatory learning, self-paced learning. Not everybody learns the same thing at the same time. We go from transmission of information to collective construction of knowledge. So children are learning all the time through dialogue and interaction, looking into their eyes, uh, not their necks. <laughs> So you know, they're constructing knowledge together. We had to design what we call dialoguing textbooks, different from the traditional textbook, reusable, and how to bring the parents into the learning process, which you know is a key variable, but without having so many PTA meetings. Because you know, in impoverished areas, you cannot get the parents every day for meetings. Because if they go to the school that day, they don't have lunch. Uh, so we had to think of very simple ways and we systematize all these process, content and pedagogy. The intelligent, open questions to take children to higher level thinking skills. So what we started so many years ago, it's now called flipped classroom, deepen skills, how do you say that? Deeper learning, um, because we try to put all these things together, but in a very simple, easily replicated way that any teacher without having a PhD could do it. Right. And also, that since we, you know, in education you have to work with, I'm, I'm originally a sociologist, so you have to think of attitudes and behaviors. How do you transform attitudes and behaviors and have motivation? So for us, the teachers themselves were the actors of change. The children 
and the teachers were the actors of change. Because Escuela Nueva, because of its long history, it became a national policy. But then how do you sustain things? Because in education, results take time. Mm. And they don't coincide with the political momentum. Mm -hmm. So another thing we learned is we've been holding the baby from government, public-private partnerships, bringing in the coffee growers, bringing in other private sector. And the crea I had to create an NGO to continue sustaining it. So there have been many, many challenges, but there are many dimensions in relation to the issue of sustainability and quality. But for sure, when it's well implemented, there are results. It seems a major and results in learning achievement and peaceful behavior. And coming out of Colombia, especially interesting. Great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So our next panelist um, is Karina Wong of the, Mil of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of the most um, interesting organizations in, in US education now. Um, it is helping to, to redefine the education ag agenda in the United States. So uh, Karina, my question for you is that, you know, your job is to basically find the best practices, the best models, and help scale it. So how do you, how do you identify great practices, and what do you look for? I was ready to transition that I don't fund international education, so, um, but I'll give you four qualities um, to how her work might fit into that. So one of the first things a funder always asks is to scale. And I think there are lots of different ways to think about scale. Um, funders often have a traditional notion of scale a place-based implementation that we're going to replicate, or a proof point that we can present that we can then replicate in other places to make it serve the same goal. And I think one of the models that they put on the table is something, I call, I, I use my own, I call it sort of the human design, that um, something that scales well is often designed well, and the design matters and the scalability. The second thing that um, funders often look for is sustainability. What's going to happen after um, we make our investment? Um, uh, and what do we invest in so that we can be sure that it's being sustained beyond the investment? The third thing I'd say is um, innovation, that we're often looking for dramatic change that will create um, a sort of multiplier effect. So what's the innovation we can invest in that won't lead to the achievement this far? What's the innovation that won't lead us to this far? Does it look more like a maverick mm -hmm. than a wave? Um, and those often don't actually have the impact so I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that we can't always fund things. I think there was probably someone who took a chance on your work before you had all the evidence in, um, before you enabled it to scale. And I think sometimes you take that big bet and you take that risk um, because you see other things in the future for it. Uh, the last thing I'd say we really look at is actually impact, and it's the data. Um, the data will tell you how well the intervention was and what the impact was on student achievement and student success. So those would be four of the factors. Now, Karina, do you have a sort of a example of a great program that you're excited about and which basically fits all four characteristics? So I've, one of the examples I talked about earlier in my panel, um, it was called the Literacy Design Collaborative. And it was interesting investment. I, got, I took a lot of heat for it from the beginning because it wasn't a normal investment. It wasn't like I just gave money to a normal organization and then they scaled something. When the Common Core was introduced into the United States um, several years ago, we looked for a set of organizations that might help us scale the literacy and math shifts that it was actually requiring. And um, I invested, I ended up investing in a set of teachers who um, sat under an organization, some of them were former teachers, who wanted to design a set of practices around literacy to teach teachers how to make the shifts in the Common Core. And they had a number of years of experience and research behind how they were thinking about it and put those teachers at the design, even though they didn't have an organization. Um, of this literacy design collaborative to create a set of tools for teachers. And I think what made it fit my criteria is they created a design that when I decided to scale it, I looked at a set of networks in the United States. Some were professional networks like the National Writing Project. Some were regional networks like the Southern Regional Educational Board. And some were charter networks. And I said, look at these tools. How pow And we had a set of teachers who would describe how powerful the tools were. And the fact that those very different diverse types of networks, as well as governments, states, Kentucky, districts, um, and different places could take that tool and use it across those networks because no one group owned it, to me said, wow, that's an important way to scale something. Fantastic. So I feel that 
um, this is a great panel because we basically have a solution now. Great teachers, create a great culture, take a lot of time to fine tune it and systemize it and get money from the Gates Foundation. So that's our solution. <laughs> now, before I open the uh, panel to um, discussion um, from, and questions from the audience, I'd like to ask one, one question uh, for, for everyone. And we, we can sh discuss this as a group. Um, Andrew Schleicher wrote a uh, report, um, Schools of 21st Century Learners. And reading the report, I came away thinking there's a major difference between leading schools and failing schools. In leading schools, there's a culture of excellence. There's a virtu virtuous circle where teachers are confident, students are engaged, and there's a willingness to take risks. There's, there's a willingness to accept, embrace, and learn from failure. Whereas in failing schools, it's the complete opposite, where students are disengaged, where teachers feel under siege from the bureaucracy and from tests, and where they take failure um, as basically a slap in the face. And they're very much um, you know, stress, under a lot of stress, and they're very afraid to take risks and open up to criticism. So what can we do about failing schools? About what can we do about failing schools? Failing schools. How do we turn around failing schools? Is there a solution to turning around failing schools? Bar Barnum, let's start with you. Well, uh, I mean, in, in England, the um, kind of accepted solution, if you've got a failing school, is you get rid of the head. Um, and you replace the head with a, with a new head with a proven track record. And maybe also you get rid of the school board or the school governance. And um, in the last uh, re few years, the government has set what is called a floor standard in England. Uh, and if your school doesn't reach that standard, which is defined in terms of public exam results, but it's not set particularly high, then that school is taken away from local authority, school, the school district control. It becomes a standalone school with a new head and new, a new school board or school governance. Um, and and on, that, on the whole, that has worked. In other words, in England, I think we have proved that uh, the the, the simplest way of turning around uh, a, a failing school is to find the right head. Mm, mm. But aren't head, well, the right heads in short, short supply? Yeah. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. That's that's the problem with that that with my answer. Um, but uh, there doesn't seem to be any very good alternative to finding good heads. And so the question is, well, how do you generate those sure, people? How sure. do you train heads? Mm, mm. How do you have processes in in, in your system to identify really good deputy heads, train them up to replace maybe the head in their school so the head can go on to uh, failing schools. And that's happening to some extent. Great. Tony? Well, two things I'd say. One, picking up from what Barnaby has just said, and that is the most effective way in the UK at the moment seems to be by organizing clusters of schools which have mm. a very strong proven executive head who is able to bring on senior leadership people, moving them from one school to another. The paradigm of the lone beacon school, I believe, doesn't really work. Mm, it's mm. too much in isolation. Mm, mm. Certainly in Slough, my neighboring town, which has some challenged schools or ch schools in challenging circumstance, there has been a significant turnaround uh, such that there is now a dozen schools, state schools, who come together and they really collaborate and share. And that is, this is making an appreciable difference. However, my second point, is that focusing on leadership isn't enough. It's a short-term hit. It's a way of jerking things into a, a new direction. But it doesn't matter how, however long we talk about structures, systems, accountability, top-down, this up, bottom-up, whatever. In the end, every time it comes down to me, to the training of our teachers, mm -hmm. to the consistent, regular, continuing training of teachers to give them the confidence to be able to be effective practitioners. And there's no shortcut to that. So the school cluster idea is very interesting because we have that in China, in Shanghai. And that's actually one of, the, uh, considered one of the main reasons why Shanghai was so successful in the PISA, because schools collaborate together. But that's government mandated. So in Britain, are school clusters government mandated, or, or, or is it by choice? More by choice. And mm. this, it's not pervasive enough yet. So how do you get leading schools to collaborate with failing schools? Oh, it, 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 it has to be driven by central government. OK. Uh, Vicky? 
Well, um, what, what we wanted to do was to spark demand from teachers that they, that, that they wanted to change in their schools. And there was a need for it at that moment. So our training, we had to design it to sort of compensate for what teachers' colleges were not doing. Mm. Or faculties of education, which are still more complicated in Latin America because we're very theoretical uh, and very academic. For example, you know, uh, in teachers' colleges, they, the word multigrade didn't even exist. And it was 60% of the rural schools. And this is all over, all over Latin America. So um, the first thing we thought is, if we're going to start a demand-driven approach from teachers themselves, you know, so not to have problems with unions afterwards, um, we had to create very simple interventions. First, that teachers would be trained with the same methodology that they would be using with their children. Because still in Latin America, we have conferences and, mm. and active participatory learning. <laughs> so the first thing was that the teachers themselves would go through a collaborative process of learning, of constructing knowledge together. So our training workshops were designed with the same methodology that they would be using with their children to avoid that contradiction we mm -hmm. have in Latin America. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that we would have demonstration schools, you know, not extraordinary schools, just schools, visual images. The only way you change attitudes is when you have a visual image. And teachers in Latin America are full of theory. And they can repeat all the, by memory all the, you know, all the theories of education. So we needed schools to demonstrate visual images and not extraordinary schools, just schools that had made the shift and the change of the way of learning. Mm. So the teachers themselves would say, we want this, we can do it. Demonstration schools, the way we train the teachers, and not leave the teachers alone. If, you're, if you, if you want to make a paradigm shift of the learning process, which is a cultural change, um, you cannot leave teachers alone. So we created what we call the micro centers, which are learning circles for teachers. And for them, it was a need. They would have together once a month by themselves and share what they were doing, share their problems, share their innovations, reflect on what they were doing. And at that moment, there were no technologies. Uh, now it would be so much interesting to really have a community of practice that everybody's talking about. But we, what we actually did was bring the teachers together. It was a need for them. So they would come together once a month and share all the problems and their innovations. So it was an horizontal diffusion of innovation that the teachers themselves took on. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the, all the evidence suggests says that the best teacher development tool is peer mentoring, when teachers observe other teachers' classrooms and give feedback. And there was another reason. <laughs> supervisors were very expensive, <laughs> you know? Okay. The per diem of the supervisors to go visit the schools, the inspectors, the traditional way of seeing things, it was very difficult. So we ended up teacher to teachers. <laughs> so I, I mean, mean I, my question then is, that's great for teachers. What do you do about this functional community? because schools are part and parcel of the community. So if the parents aren't engaged, if the, if the parents don't believe in education, if the mother or the father isn't there, yeah. if, there are, if there's you know, child abuse in the home, what do you do in that instance? The first thing that we, we, we wanted is that parents, at least in Latin America, parents value education a lot. Um, but the second thing we wanted is that parents un understand the innovation. You know, at the beginning, it was if we didn't bring the parents into the process, you know, they say, these kids are playing. That's not the way we learned. They're playing all the time. <laughs> you know? uh, so it was how also to change the, the attitudes of the parents, how to bring them into the learning process, how to strengthen their self-esteem, how they would see what that it. So we have, we have designed very specific instruments to bring the community close to the school. Um, and that parents would participate in the learning process. How? That anything the child would learn could apply to the family and community. And even if the parents didn't know how to read and write, they have knowledge. So that children could bring knowledge from their parents into the classroom, into the school. That's fantastic. So yeah. that anything the child learned could be applied. So here we used it for health, 
for environmental issues. You know, I ask my mother if my little siblings have all the vaccinations or not. If they don't have the vaccinations, we make a list and we put it in a visible place in our house. So it was bringing concrete activities to make curriculum relevant and meaningful. So parents started seeing that children were happier, they were learning more. Um, there are simple school governments in place. Uh, by the way, girls' participation is boosted totally. And so parents would see that their children were happier, that they were not dropping out, and that they were also bringing knowledge of the community into the school. Fantastic. So, but in a very simple way, because if you do things in a complicated way, it's not going to be easily replicated. So we had to, you know, a lot of, of design. Now, at that time, we didn't know anything about design thinking. And then, but it was just doing it with the teachers themselves. And apparently, that's supposed to be what one should do. <laughs> Karina? Yeah, I, I would add to what Vicki was describing, I think of as professional culture. Mm. And so some of the investments that we made, um, I led an investment portfolio around innovative professional development. And one of the things that we tried to do, there were sort of two theories of action there, that um, now that the that, um, schools were having more data about how teachers were performing, if you gave them that data and you gave them opportunities, you could personalize their learning. And then the, the other piece of work was around sort of teacher engagement and collective learning, that it's not all about the individual, it's about the collective set of teachers. And what we found in the first, it's we're only a couple years into those investments, um, I think that the engagement just shot up in places where we double down on the collective learning mm. versus the places that tried to use new tools and technology to actually individualize learning. And it said to me very something very important about the importance of professional culture in schools. And the reason why that collective learning time was so important is because it, would, it gave teachers the time to be the professionals that they want to be. They could get off the treadmill. They had one full day a week in these schools is what they were able to figure out how to do within their existing budgets by transforming their schedules. And that was a sufficient number of time for teachers each week to begin to sort of reboot, rethink, and have the kinds of conversations that Vicki was talking about. Great. So I'm hearing a lot of people-based solutions, invest in teachers. But then the question is, what if teachers don't want to change? Or how do you make sure that professional development time, collaboration, I is effective? What, how, how, how do you measure collaboration? So I think one of the most important things is to have great protocols in place. So a number of schools in the United States have professional learning communities. Um, they're wasted. Uh, they're after school, they're too short, and there's, they're used up for administrative things as, a ro as opposed to things around instruction. So I think one of the most important things is to have some really important, strong protocols on the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then you find teachers, when you have those protocols on the table, like bring your student work in the assignment, teachers have conversations about, how are you able to get to the student to be able to perform in that way? Wow, how might I do that in my classroom? And I think that's the next round of creating the professional culture because teachers are holding themselves accountable for performance rather than an external entity, whether it's the state, the government, the district, the principal, saying you have to perform at these levels. They're saying, I want to perform at higher levels, and I have a colleague who knows how to help me do that. But aren't protocols also value judgments? So how, how do you convince different cultures to accept the, uh, the protocols? Or I don't think they're more value judgments. When I say protocols, I mean things like lesson study or a, a, a learning cycle where it's sort of um, st um, study, learn, act, those kinds of things. It's the kind of things that you see Atul Gawande talking about in the healthcare industry. I'm really well. interested in that point. But what strikes me is, of course, this isn't just relevant to inadequate or uncompetent teachers. It applies just as much to the very experienced teacher who believes he or she has the one and only way to do what he or she is doing. So this business about creating a culture of open-mindedness so that our teachers learn to be, if they are not already nimble and able to adapt, seems to me more important now than it has ever been. Absolutely of the moment. Everyone agrees, apparently. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you. Can, I, can I just mention the London challenge? Sure. That uh, one of the things that has most improved education in England um, in the last 50 years, really, was the, with the London challenge, which everyone can look up uh, on the internet, which operated between 2003 and 2008 in London, obviously, and but there was a similar scheme in Birmingham. Um, and London went from being the set of school districts with the worst exam results in England to just about the best, with the most disadvantaged population. So it's worth studying the London Challenge. And what they did was 
uh, just focus on improving the quality of your average teacher. Mm. And uh, they, they, they had teams of expert teachers who went into schools. Well, let me, let me say the first thing, to go back to the question of how do you persuade them to do it, the first thing they did was collect data. Collect data on the performance of individual schools and individual subjects within those schools. And then they grouped schools into families of schools that were similar to each other. And then they were able to say, look, your school is similar to this one, but look how much better that one mm -hmm. is doing than you. Mm -hmm. Or your academic department is getting these results, but look at that academic department in a very similar school, same subject, getting far better results. And that produced, amongst teachers in London, a sort of sense of moral urgency, mm. that they could see there was a problem, and they could see that some schools and some teachers had solved it. Mm -hmm. And that opened the way to the allowing expert teachers to come in and then do intensive training to raise the standard of those teachers. And then they had to, and this was the important thing, they had then had to demonstrate that they had learned something, that they modeled it, they replicated it, they were, they were going to be observed over a long period of time, it took quite a lot of resources, but it had a profound effect. So we would say there are models out there. Mm, mm, mm. Fantastic. So right now, uh, I'm going to open the discussion to the audience because obviously we've assembled an amazing panel of experts, and we want to solve every problem right now. So any questions or any comments, please contribute to the discussion. So any questions or uh, comments? Yes? If you could just introduce yourself really quickly. Uh, Armin Doucette, school teacher in Canada. Uh, Barnaby's going to hear me for the third time, I think, today. Uh, <laughs> the question is, with the World Health Organization, uh, they've, decide, well, they've declared that there is an uh, obesity epidemic or malnutrition mm. epidemic. And I'm wondering how, uh, in particular, Tony and Barnaby, how you guys have uh, taken that into account in your schools to create a culture of physical activity, health, uh, for the whole life cycle. Tony, wh wh when do you start? The traditional model of a British boarding school <laughs> surprises people in a number of ways, but one of them is the fact that there's relatively little time spent inside the classroom. And I have always worked on the assumption that there are two axiomatic issues involved in education. The first is that young people, of course we all want great teachers and they're inspirational and so on, but young people in the end learn more from each other than they do from adults mm. and they learn more outside a classroom than they do mm, inside. Mm, mm. So the whole of the way we try and create a boarding environment is predicated on those two assumptions. So for example, operating on a six full day week, three of the afternoons, the whole afternoons are given over to physical activity of one kind or another, and indeed significant chunks of the other three days are given over as well. So in terms of taught time, the time on the whole as a teenager, you're going to be sitting down in some environment or other. It would account for every morning six days a week and for only a tiny proportion of any of the afternoons. So most of the afternoons are engaged in physical activity mm. of some kind, by which I also include whether it's drama or uh, music rehearsals or whatever it might be. So I think if you have a busy and full environment, that solves a lot of the problem. However, there is also a need, and I think we have been in the infancy of this, of creating a much better educational program for young people around their own health awareness. Now, this is, uh, funny enough, this is an example where government has been ahead of the game and schools have been slow to catch up. Mm. Quite often it's the other way around. Yeah. But in this regard, I don't think schools in the UK have been anything like as effective enough as they should be in spreading that message. It's a work in progress. Barnaby? Yeah, I mean, the only, other, the only thing I want to add to that, and that is that, you know, uh, Tony and I have spent our lives, by and large, dealing with teenage boys. And if you give teenage boys the choice between going out and playing a sport or doing, sitting at home doing nothing, on the whole, they'll, they prefer to do nothing. So what, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the way we deal with that is, first of all, by using compulsion. You know, we will force the younger pupils, particularly, to go and do something. And secondly, by offering quite a wide range of different types of sporting activity in the hope that all of them will find something that they quite enjoy. So by the time they're 16 or 17, they become self-motivated. And 
Uh, and on the whole, that, that works. Um, but nevertheless, there may still be some who uh, don't want to get involved. But nevertheless, you know, because their health matters, it is very important that they all go out and do some physical exercise uh, every day or, or on as many days as we can manage. Now, Vicky, you service a lot of poor communities where nutrition can be an issue. So where, where? You, you, you help a lot of poor communities. Your schools are in poor communities where nutrition can be an issue sometimes, making sure that kids have enough to eat. Um, so is that an issue where you work? And oh. how, 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 how do you address that? Well, we incorporated all, all let's say, the, the basic 10 child survival <laughs> dimensions of health, cross-cutting in all the subjects, um, the nutrition issues, environmental issues. Um, in a very simple way, it's cross-cutting so that we would start also affecting health prevention mm, mm. in children. And of course, nutrition also, because they would take information. Children become agents of change in their families. And they bring, we had to think of very simple ways, mm, but children would you know, s start becoming agents of change, of influencing. And we have had results, um, not only on the health issue and the nutrition, because you can see the difference, um, with the children, their self-esteem was improved, but also how the children are also having influence on the relationships in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, how, um, just, just, just last week, there was an article in the New York Times about Escuela Nueva. That is quite interesting, because uh, something that for us is important is that it's not seen only as a solution for poor remote schools. It's just a good way of learning and putting it in a practical way not adding too much work to the teachers also, because there's something that teachers don't have time to plan. Sure. Wonderful lesson plans every day and in a multi-grade setting less. So we had to think of how to shift those lesson plans to the children in form of intelligent questions. Now, Karina, before you worked for Bill Gates, you worked for Alice Waters, who is this revolutionary visionary in healthy eating. Um, and so there's an, obviously an, an obesity epidemic in American schools. And so how do you address this? How, how are you addressing this issue? Yeah, it's like our employer doesn't have the budget to send folks in, but um, Alice believes in something she called edible education, which is really about creating a healthy mindset, and you do that by hands-on activities. Hands activities in the kitchen and the garden. Um, the obesity rates are astonishing in the United States. I think they're less down on the <laughs> ground. Um, uh, for type 2 diabetes, and I think one of the one of the things can that shift a child is they're planting a carrot and they pull that carrot out of the ground and they taste it when it comes out of the ground. And she really believes, and as do I, in engaging students in kitchen and gardens to really shape the way they think about what they eat and how they eat. Thank you. Um, we have 10 minutes left. I'm gonna take, so, sorry. No, no, sorry, it's just questions. Okay, uh, just one more question, please. Um, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Vandana Goyal, and I run a network of schools um, with, in partnership with the government in Mumbai, in India. Um, and all of you mentioned data um, being used in different ways, um, either as a means to an end or in the way that you select where to invest. And I'm curious, um, when you say data, what do you think is the most important data to look at um, when determining whether a school is highly effective? because I think we tend to focus um, a lot on the quantitative um, types of data um, on literacy and numeracy, but I think as educators, we know that there's many other factors that are driving quality. So I was curious what your views are on, on how to do that also at a systemic level. In, in our situation, well, um, learning, uh, learning achievements is crucial. Everybody measures, now countries are, you know, have systems to evaluate uh, achievement in language math. For us, it was crucial to also evaluate democratic behavior, uh, cooperative attitudes, self-esteem, so, uh, and girls' participation. So we introduced these qualitative type of measures, and, and, and we've seen it. We've seen yeah. the change. Yeah. Whenever I go into a school, there, one of the things I always look for is um, I look at the quality of student work. What are the students working on? You can tell a lot about the school, about what's on the wall, and what's the kind of assignments that teachers are asking kids to, what kind of problems are they asking kids to solve? Um, there's a lot of data in that. Autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, the, the, I'm sure the answer to your question should be progress data. So you me measure them when they arrive, you measure them when they leave, you show the value added. That's the, for us the most useful form of data. And you can find the progress data of pretty well every school in England um, on the England Department for Education website. It's quite interesting. Um, beyond that, we're a bit nervous about data, partly because, you know, as Tony has said, we believe that some of the most important things can't be measured, but partly because we find that in England, um, the, the whole system gets corrupted by the way in which the government then starts using the data to force schools to move in certain directions. So even if it became possible to measure things like your personality, your character, your uh, ability to perform in sport or music, we probably would resist wanting to measure that because we have seen what the government can do with that data. I was speaking to Andrew Schleicher yesterday. This will cheer you, really cheer you, Barnaby. He says they're right on the edge of having what he calls reliable data for the measurement of character. The thought is pretty appalling, I think. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. there we are. For the very reason you give, it's how that information will be manipulated and used. A very good exercise to do with your students in a maths class is give them a set of data and enable them to produce completely reverse rank order according to the way they play with the statistics. It's a loaded weapon, and we should be very careful. Two things I'm interested in, or would be interested in a school, is over time to see where students end up. Remarkably difficult to get hold of that information as things stand. Uh, and the other point I just throw in, I think it's a really good question. It's a very important question. I sit on the council of a university in the UK, and that council has been shaken over the last three years by the advent of serious student satisfaction surveys. To have three years in a row a leading department flashing red on every measure because the teaching is perceived to be inadequate and the students don't think they're getting a good deal has given more of a shot in the arm than anything that university has had in a generation. And I think we underplay student satisfaction within our own schools. Thank you. So um, one closing remarks. Um, this has been a great panel. Um, I want to be provocative and say that um, turning around schools is very difficult. I agree that it requires school leadership. But my last question for the panel, and we'll conclude, is what kind of school leadership do we need? And my personal theory is that we don't pay enough to emotional intelligence. We need leaders who aren't actually visionaries but who are fantastic managers, who are fantastic people people, who are empathy, because change is hard. If you take a fat kid, uh, who, you know, you take a kid who's obese, and you try to make him um, exercise, you think in theory that's an easy thing to do, but try it. It's a, very, it's a very traumatic experience for the child. So when we talk about sc turning schools around, um, it's all, it can be a traumatic experience for the people involved, especially the teachers, uh, but also for the students. So, Final, final thoughts on school leadership and what kind of leaders do we need? They, they're two separate things, but they're overlapping. Both can, we know, both sectors can learn something from each other. Right. Uh, so I think we have a great danger in overcomplicating education. I've been in the, the education business for a long time. I've <coughs> seen initiatives come and go. I've seen jargon rain down from the heavens. But in the end, it seems to me quite a simple thing. A few years ago, there was discovered an old wall painting at Eton College, which has been dated to the year 1520, and it's fragments but it's the oldest representation of a schoolroom scene in Britain. And there it is on the wall. And you can see the teacher, and you can see students quite literally sitting on their forms, some working, some not. But above it is a strap line, and it's a quotation taken from Quintilian. So this is a couple of thousand years old. And it simply says that it's the excellence of teachers to identify the talents of their pupils. This goes back right through our understanding of the history of education is coming alongside students. And uh, it seems to me the real art of leadership, to answer your question, is it doesn't matter what style of institution you're in, 
is that the leadership is in service to the young people. And it's down to whoever's running places to come alongside the students. And too often, in the way we talk about education, it's the other way around. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Barnaby, do you have anything to add? Uh, we just want to get some closing remarks from all the panelists. Yeah, I'll be, I'm going to make two quick remarks. First, to answer your question, I certainly don't believe there is any one leadership model. Um, I mean, I have known and seen heads who have been very autocratic, mm, mm. didn't have an empathetic bone in their body, who have been very <laughs> successful. <laughs> Others, other heads who were highly empathetic, didn't appear to do very much all day, and yet ran uh, very successful schools. Um, and secondly, to just to echo what uh, both Vicky and Tony have said, and that is that uh, a lot of what one might say about schools or educational leaders is rather obvious. It is quite simple, but it's its simplicity and obviousness of a quite a tricky kind. Um, and it's easy to overcomplicate it. Things should be kept simple, whatever system you're in. But implementation is a lot more difficult than simply constructing a system. Sure, sure. Thank you. Vicky, close, closing remarks? I, I reinforce what both of you said. Make things simple. We had, and, and for us, it was really a need to make things simple so that teachers would not feel that this would be additional work, a burden, you know, the handling diversity, all these, all these dimensions. So it was making it easy. But at the same time, when we just shifted the way of learning from a teacher-centered type of education to, to really child-centered, uh, collaborative, self-paced learning, um, the role of the teacher changed. So the teacher assumed a more um, effective relationship, had more time to know their students, uh, strengthen empathy, um, get to know their families a little bit more because they would also be leading in the community. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a more effective type of relationship, which is the real role of the teacher, understanding the different styles of learning of children. Because now they don't have, you know, we take away the burden of all this tremendous planning that they had to do. Um, and this for us was crucial. So the effective relationship between children and teachers were strengthened. And that was amazing for self-esteem. And if you don't have self-esteem, you don't learn. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably a lot more important for the teacher to have those kinds of qualities, maybe an instructional leader, um, and lots of teachers have them. You know, I, I think your question was important. Good schools are good schools, whether they're in the UK or they're in Colombia, whether they're highly resources, resourced or under-resourced. We know what good instruction looks like. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Thank you so much. So this has been a fantastic very thought-provoking discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you.